how we build a product. So it is, uh, it is an article of faith at Cloudera that platform software has to be open source. So nobody chooses proprietary OSs in a broad scale out way anymore. You just don't. Linux changed that, right? If you think about the database landscape, lots of new database adoption, and certainly most of the database growth, is going into open source technologies, not proprietary technologies. The pieces of infrastructure that are plumbing in the data center are all moving to open source. Look at, uh, look at middleware, look at databases, I said. CIOs prefer that a single vendor not lock their data off, not lock their analytics or their data processing workloads up. And so if an open source product is basically at feature parity with a proprietary version, proprietary guy loses every time. The open source product can even suck a little bit relative to the proprietary thing <laughs> because you know that software gets better over time, right? By the way, that was a second knock on Hadoop early. A lot of us didn't understand. We all looked at MapReduce and we thought somehow that was a law of physics, right? So it was written in Java and it was hard to program and batch mode latencies and, and therefore there was a deep architectural flaw. It turns out MapReduce was just a distributed processing framework and you could dream up other ones that would run on this scale out data infrastructure. And over time the platform got much better than just that original processing engine. Anyway, the, the conviction is the plumbing the infrastructure software must be open source or it can't win. And, and it can start out worse than proprietary alternatives and still win enough to invest in and get better. And that's what happened with Linux and it's certainly what's happened with the Hadoop ecosystem. All right, so you gotta be pure play open source in the platform, right? You've got no choice. You're not gonna win customers otherwise. Here's the problem. And we got this a little bit from Sleepy Cat, but much more we observed it in the open source ecosystem in the early and middle 2000s. It's just blindingly hard to build a large business on pure play open source delivering only services, right? The problem is, as the market gets more competitive, big vendors with a lot of cash come in and drive the platform cost to zero because they can afford to do that. So if all you've got is the same open source bits that a big vendor has, they're gonna beat you on price every single time. You may be able to win the deals because you're more expert, because you're better, but you know what? You're gonna win it at pretty close to zero on price. The, the, the market will force your price down if all you have is open source bits. Result is, we believed at Cloudera, we need some defensible IP that a big vendor can't come in and just take. The platform has to be open source. That's non-negotiable or they won't adopt it. So what can you build that is proprietary that sets you apart? Not proprietary to lock the customer in, but rather to lock big co out, right? That's what was in, that, that was our strategic thinking from the very beginning. What we did was build management, monitoring, administrative tools. So those of you in the database world think Oracle Enterprise Manager, but for Hadoop, right? The data, database layer basically is all pure play open source, but if you want to deploy, operate it, then you're going to buy the console and the dashboard. And no matter what vendor you go with, you're going to have a different console or dashboard. Our strategy has always been to complement that open source platform with proprietary differentiation to maintain a separation between kind of platform stuff and our proprietary tooling. Over time, our proprietary IP has changed as the market has matured, and that will continue to be true. But we go to market with proprietary software alongside open source. Um, and it's worked. Uh, we've got a bunch of very big deployments. We released some numbers a couple months ago. So we're north of 100 million bucks in revenue on our last fiscal year. Uh, more than 525 accounts as customers. That is, you know, pick a large bank. We may have 10 deals with that bank, but accounts as one customer. So we're not a big company yet, but we're not a startup anymore. We're a growth stage business. Um, and the market as a whole is growing, so we're seeing lots of opportunity for expansion and so on in our install base. Um, I believe that strategy permits us to continue to invest as we need to in differentiation growth. So we always want to be a product company. It's key to have the best product in the market, which means we need high revenues at good margins that allow us to invest in further innovation. Right. So right now, uh, we've got the largest revenue stream. We're reasonably cash efficient. 
Uh, and we've got a significant cash pile, and I'll tell that story in just a minute. But it lets us invest in the platform and continue to differentiate ourselves. So philosophically and strategically, that is who Cloudera is as an open source vendor. I, actually, the last thing I'll say is two companies in history have broken uh, 100 million bucks as pure play open source vendors, us and Red Hat. Uh, and Red Hat is a great example and, and one we strive to emulate. They just closed out a fantastic year, like 1.6, 1.7 billion in revenue, so. Uh, okay, so business grew from those early days, 2008, 2009, into a real enterprise player. We began to do larger deals with more traditional style customers. The installed base grew, the company grew. As many questions as you guys want to ask about that, I'll be happy to answer. Um, just a little bit more than a year ago now, uh, we had our most significant funding event uh, in the company's history. The uh, trajectory of funding at, at the business was a Series A round in 2008. I told you that five million bucks of Excel money. I closed the deal, so I actually should know what the number was for our Series B. Um, that was a long time ago. Maybe another six and a half or seven came in in, uh, in May of 2009. Greylock led that round. We did a third round about a year and a half later. We didn't need the cash. And, and actually, that's been true of every round that we've raised except for, the, except for the A. We didn't go out looking for it, it came to us. In general, we've had all of the cash from the previous round still in the bank when we did the next round. When we raised our Series C round, we were dealing with large banks, and they were just worried about our staying power as a vendor. Right? They, they would look at my balance sheet and say, man, a strong wind would blow you away. I can't afford to do a big deal with you. You gotta bulk up. So we went out and raised 25 million bucks from Meritech in a Series C round just in order to have $25 million. Right? We didn't want to spend it on anything. We just wanted to reassure customers that we'd be able to be around. We raised a few more rounds, netting $141 million over Series A through E. And, and objectively, you guys, $141 million, it, it sort of seems like you should be able to get a company going on that kind of money, right? That's, you know, that's a respectable amount of cash. Um, in the tail end of 2013, the beginning of 2014, uh, we decided we wanted to prepare for IPO, so we did what a lot of companies did. We went out to raise what's called a mezzanine round. So instead of talking to tr traditional venture capitalists, you go to Wall Street and you talk to public market investors. Uh, so T. Rowe Price is our example. They mostly only invest in the public market, but these days they will sometimes buy equity in the private market from a promising company that they're excited about. So as a company preparing for IPO, you want to go do that deal because later on when you go hit Wall Street and you're on your roadshow for your IPO, all of the investors, well, T. Rowe's in there. So, you know, these guys must be okay, right? So T. Rowe led our Series F round with a couple of other public market uh, buyers um, and uh, a couple of individual investors. Michael Dell came in, Google came in. Um, but anyway, that was great. We raised another 160 million bucks. Uh, and we figured that was kind of it. We had reserved a small portion of that round for strategic investment. So I talked about Dell, Michael Dell, and I talked about Google. We began talking with Intel in the latter part of the year into the, uh, like through New Year's about joining as a strategic investor. Um, Intel had a big strategic interest in expanding consumption of servers in the data center, right? Um, Intel has like 94% market share, right? There's no growth when you've got 94%, right? I mean, you, know, you, you don't get to go get that other like 3% and brag about it, right? The only way that you can drive more consumption, drive growth is by driving more servers into the data center. So it turns out Hadoop does that, right? It's a big scale out, lots of racks full of, you know, Intel boxes. Um, and by the way, Intel is keen to drive computation networking storage into the environment at large. All this internet of things, or as I like to think, call about it, internet of almost soon to be compromised things. Um, <laughs> that is all, all of that is a good place for in, Intel Silicon to land, right? Um, 
by creating an ecosystem that is big data friendly, Intel creates a larger market for its hardware, right? Um, so we began strategic discussions with Intel. Now they'd had a big data play of their own. They were in the market with Hadoop on their own account. Um, we really liked the Intel global field and their ability to basically reach the entire planet. I think they liked a lot who we were and our focus on open source and our ability to drive the projects forward. I think they liked the business philosophy. Um, but for our, from, from our point of view, strategically at Cloudera, the thing we liked best was Intel knows today what's going to be in the silicon five and 10 years from now, right? I mean, they designed some chips and then they got to go build a wafer fab factory. Right? I mean, there's a long lead time in produ producing those chips. So they know exactly what architectural features they'll be delivering to the market in the out years. By working with them, we get to look into the chip pipeline for the coming years. And we get to optimize the software to take advantage of new computational capabilities, new memory and network architectures, <coughs> We all design for servers today. A lot of our bigger customers now are designing for racks, so every bit of storage in a rack is sort of equidistant from every processor. If you go talk to the architects of Facebook, they think in those terms about their data center, right? The servers we build for are going to look very different in years to come. So if we get to look at that chip roadmap, we can drive the platform forward, we can innovate in the product. Remember, we want to be a product company. We can still have the best product on the market. That was super attractive to us. Intel wanted to protect itself in the big data ecosystem. So like here's the nightmare scenario, right? Intel strikes a strategic alliance around Hadoop with Cloudera and then IBM buys Cloudera, right? And then Intel is kind of standing there with nobody to dance with, right? Um, result was in exchange for the strategic partnership, which we really badly wanted, Intel wanted to be sure that they were able to defend themselves in the market. They insisted on a meaningful ownership stake in Cloudera as a result. And we negotiated for a long time, and we settled on 18%. Um, and just because that's where we could settle, I think, is the answer to the question. Um, Intel paid $740 million for 18% of Cloudera. We did not do it because we needed $740 million. We did it to look at the chip roadmap. Intel wanted to put the money in in order to protect itself. Now, no Intel exec makes this claim. This is just me talking independently. But if IBM were to show up right now with an offer for Cloudera, there's an Intel executive on my board of directors <laughs> who would know that that had happened. And she could recuse herself from the vote and saddle up and compete for the deal. And here's the genius part. IBM, or any other company, has to buy 100% of Cloudera. Intel just needs to buy 82%. <laughs> it's locked in a discount, right? It's locked in a discount. Um, they believe, I think, that that protects them. Certainly, we like it because we believe it assures our path to IPO, right? There's no point for a big company to make a play for us if they know that they're just going to get outbid, so we're not going to have to put up with that distraction. 740 million bucks. On top of 160 in the mezzanine round, on top of 141 in Series A through, you guys, we raised more than a billion dollars in cash. This is a software company, right? I mean, like I feel like a side business building airplanes. <laughs> it's ridiculous to have that kind of cash if you're in the software business. It wasn't our intent to raise that kind of money, but with that cash pile, we've actually got some real options. We will, we want to, we intend to uh, have an IPO one day. We want to be a publicly traded business. But you know, there's no time pressure on us at all, right? There are a lot of reasons to have an IPO, right? It's a great branding event, gives more transparency to customers who want to buy your products. Um, it's great for morale inside the company, gives people liquidity. For most companies, it's because you need the cash, right? For Cloudera, it will not be for that reason. We're in a position right now where we can invest in ways that the public markets might not let us do. And in fact, we've been acquiring companies over the past couple of years, about a peso one a quarter lately. We made some buys that we're really pleased with. We're in a position to keep doing that. 
I gotta go convince my board of directors, but they know us, they know our strategy, and they're generally pretty supportive of what we're doing. I don't have to go convince Wall Street that a non-accretive acquisition makes sense. If it makes sense to us strategically, we can just go do it. Okay. So we've got that latitude. We still intend to IPO, but we're in a position where we can do it when it makes sense, when the timing is right for us. And that's absolutely what we intend to do. Um, the business is going great. I guess the, the one other anecdote I'll tell and then maybe try to wind down. I'm coming up on my 45 minutes self, uh, self allotted. Um, I was the company's founding CEO. I stepped out of that role in the middle of 2013. Sorry, 2013, yeah. Middle of 2013. Come up on two years ago now. Um, so you guys understand how that went. When we started, there were four of us sitting around a borrowed conference table in a conference room of the AdMob offices in San Mateo. That was the first place that me, Christoph, Jeff, and Almer found to work. Um, by the middle of 2013, we were 425, 430 people spread across the world. Um, you can imagine 425, 430 folks consume a lot of cash, and so good financial planning is absolutely essential and some discipline and CFO style operations is a big deal. Um, the revenues were getting big enough that it was starting to get important for us to be able to forecast pipeline and you know when deals were going to come in and you know get a li little bit more accurate about our sales forecasting. And I will repeat from the beginning of the talk, you guys I'm an engineer, right? I mean not only am I not good at that stuff, I really dislike it. <laughs> and yet it was crucial to the business. It was very, very important that we be able to do that. Um, I went to the board. I had a conversation with them about a change in roles. Um, we talked about it. They were very supportive. Uh, and we very quietly launched a search in the very early part of 2014. Yeah, yeah. Tom's coming up on two. No. Yeah, uh, 2014. Late in the night. Um, we very <laughs> quietly launched the search. The company didn't know what we were doing. Um, only the actual board members, even the management team, didn't know. Um, we talked to a lot of good candidates. Tom Riley, who wound up ta taking the job, had stepped in as the CEO in place of a technical founder who stayed in the company previously. Uh, when he was at ArcSight, he did that. Uh, and he ran ArcSight up to a very successful IPO and then acquisition by Hewlett Packard where he hung around for a while. Tom's a sales guy from the ground up, right? I mean, that's where he was born, that's what he does, that's what he loves. He's a perfect compliment to me, right? I'm, I'm an engineer, right? I, I still know how the software works. I like thinking about it. We're like Batman and Robin. You right? <laughs> can't sneak up behind us. <laughs> We've built a very good relationship over the last couple of years. And that has a lot to do with him and his character. He's worked very hard to be sure that our relationship is good, that it works, and it's let me spend my time in the field talking to customers about what they're doing and what we can do together, to work with our partners in building out full stack solutions on top of this database layer of the 2010s uh, so that we can really go to market at high value. Um, I get to come and talk to groups like this, right? I get to concentrate my time on the stuff that I am both competent at and enjoy best. And, and I think where I'm really uniquely able in the company to do a good job. My job title is Chief Strategy Officer. You guys know what that does? The CSO does? Yeah, you have no idea, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's why this is a good job. <laughs> the, job is, the job is kind of whatever it needs to be at any given time. Um, it's been a fantastic transi transition. I'm proud of a lot of stuff at Cloudera. I, I'm proud of a lot of stuff at Cloudera. But I'm most proud of the way we executed that transition. Um, actually, just one more anecdote. So we found Tom, and he and I spent like the spring really hanging out together and being sure that we'd be able to work together. And the management team didn't know at the time. Just a, just a very small group in the boardroom knew, knew what was going on. I was super nervous about the transition, because usually you know what happens, right? The new guy comes in, and the old guy gets run over by a bus. <laughs> um, Tom and I talked a lot about it. I don't think either one of us wanted it. But I spent some time talking with folks at Google where, uh, where Sergey and Larry had very effectively handed off to Eric. Right? They'd made that transition work. Uh, and I want to understand how they did that. I went and spent a lot of time with Reid Hoffman at LinkedIn, who 
had been CEO, stepped back, that didn't work so good, he stepped back in. And then he brought in Jeff Wiener, and they're running a fantastic business together, um, and they executed that transact transition very, very well. Um, we approached it intentionally. So here's how it happened. We geared up, like, in the end of May, beginning of June, we brought the senior staff into the room uh, and basically told them what was happening. Uh, and a day or two later, we told the entire company, almost no time at all, because it's a big secret and you couldn't keep it, right? So we didn't want to give a lot of time. So we told the company and simultaneously publicly announced it. And then Tom and I were both together at the company for a week, right? And we talked to everybody and walked around the entire organization and met with every single group. And separately and together, we explained what the transition was. And then Tom left. He disappeared for a month, right? And I spent the time letting the company like grief, right? Oh my God, Mike, is it gonna have, what's gonna happen? It's a sales guy, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to everybody through it, making sure that they had a chance to be heard. Uh, and then Tom came back. Uh, and about a week later, I left. And I turned my phone off, and I didn't answer email. And I was gone, and the intent was, you know, if you didn't understand what Tom was, you didn't like what you were, you couldn't call me, right? It's Tom's the CEO. You got to deal with him. Um, I intentionally have no direct reports today, and that's a hangover from that original change. If there had been Tom Riley with a bunch of the exec team and Mike Olson with a small team over here, it could have been Tom's guys and Mike's guys. It would have been a mess, right? So we very carefully approached that trans transition. And I'm super proud of how well it went. I'm super, super proud. Um, it was really hard work, and emotionally, by the way, difficult, right? CEO, I think the Middle East is ego. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> even if you want to get rid of the job, it's a hard thing to do. Um, but we made it work. And, and I will say, uh, great for the business and great for me personally. Uh, I think Cloudera is way better off. We could never have done that Intel deal if it was Mike Olson's company. We could do it because Tom and Mike working together, and he was driving the engagement and strategy. Um, this is like a year plus later. We continue to grow. Uh, business continues to do very, very well. The market's getting a lot more interesting and competitive, and that's been uh, fun to watch unfold in the recent year, uh, and we expect that to continue. But, but look, on the back of enormous opportunity, uh, I said last year, tail end of the year at the Hadoop World Conference, I believe this is a $1 trillion a year market. I believe that that much will be spent on big data, data analytics, storage, processing across the spectrum. Platform, applications, tools, services, all of that is going to roll up to a $1 trillion in the aggregate because we're going to drive so much value out of that data that it will be worth the money to do that. That's about 10 times the size of the traditional business data processing market right now. But I, it kind of stands to reason. If data volumes are going up by 1,000, you ought to be able to grow the revenue by a factor of 10. You ought to be able to get at least 10 times the value out of that data. Um, given that opportunity, every single major and venture-backed company on the planet is interested in this space. And we're watching lots and lots of activity happen. Um, thanks for listening to my long ramble. I'll stop now. Rob, you want to come up and yeah. do some Q&A? And um, anyone who wants to ask a question, anyone who wants to ask a question, you want to line up here. So, and, and so, um, uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll get started with the first one, which is maybe just talk a little bit about the consumerization part, which was in the title of your of your talk. So, so it seems like a lot of the way um, Cloudera's model is. It's very traditional enterprise sales, enterprise marketing, enterprise um, deployment and services. And, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of that is, has been sort of very painful, very problematic. And you see a lot of new models. You, you see kind of SaaS-like models. You see Dropbox-like models. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts about uh, just uh, kind of how to build an enterprise company? Um, 
It's an excellent question. Uh, so the first thing that I'll point out is for my entire life, I've been an enterprise software guy, right? I mean, you know, if, if there's a database, I probably touched it at some point. Um, around the time we were getting started, the hot companies were Zynga and Groupon. And those guys used to drive me nuts, right? I mean, like we'd grind away for months or a deal, and we'd bring it home. And these guys were selling imaginary pigs. <laughs> they're making good money, right? Right? So, so look, we didn't build a traditional consumer business because we didn't know how to build a traditional consumer business. Um, what interested me, though, was that the meaningful innovation had come from the consumer internet and not from the database space. And you know, I spent 25 years in academic, and then, oh yeah, and shout out to Stonebreaker Touring Award, man. You know what? This is the first year that there's a $1 million prize attached to that, right? Stonebreaker waited till now. Guys. As if he needs all that money. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, 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 it is interesting to me that the traditional academic and industrial database research didn't basically build this scale out platform. I, I think it's classic innovators dilemma. We were so focused on the very high end, very demanding, refined problems that we had been born to solve, OLTP problems especially, that we didn't see the opportunity in, in the other thing. Um, so I think that the consumer sector is inventing technologies now that are moving into the enterprise. Look at Dropbox, right? A, a service that and box as well that we use a bunch of at Cloud Era. Um, but if you look at our sales force, if you look at our go-to-market model, I mean, we look a whole lot more like IBM and Oracle and Sybase and Microsoft than we look like Zynga or Groupon, right? We, we don't have that kind of virality. We still slug it out uh, in the old-fashioned way for every sale. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. Millen? So, Millen. yeah, I have one question. I actually have two questions. Can you guys hear? Is the microphone on? Yeah, the first one I'm, uh, I'm going to ask him first uh, is uh, where do you think the whole containers and uh, uh, you know the Kubernetes coming out of Google, where does that fit with this whole data uh, analytics ecosystem? And and then I will ask. The okay, yeah. So 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 let me answer that one. And actually, I bet there's a lot of people in the room, including including Lynn, who have uh, um, some thoughts on that. We view that containerization, at least from Cloudera's point of view as in some sense orthogonal to the big data platform we deliver. That is to say, containerization is a very interesting technology. How do we make sure that we're taking advantage of containerization and easy deployment in the context of delivering big data infrastructure? Um, I think that containerization is crucial to making large scale public and private clouds work. You gotta have it, right? Um, those of you who have watched the announcements in the space lately, and especially Google's move on Kubernetes, you know, you stop and you think for a little bit. Very, very interesting, right? What Kubernetes as open source promoted technology does is make it incredibly easy for workloads to migrate to the Google Cloud, right? So if I were Google, I'd probably invent a thing like that as well. Um, we see public cloud deployment of our platform as a major strategic imperative, a big driver of revenue in not very many years. We've got a, a modest number of customers, but some very big ones running on public cloud today. Uh, we've got a whole bunch more running on sort of elastic, OpenStack, or VMware style uh, elasticities in their own data centers. So we're paying close attention. Um, Hard to say yet exactly how it needs to be integrated into all the platform, but but it's certainly an area that we're paying attention to. Right. Uh, and, and the second question that I had, and you knew it was coming because I had warned you before, is uh, uh, you know a lot of people have read your blog post about ODP, yes, uh, uh, open data platform that uh, when I was at Pivotal, I basically championed. Uh, so what? Is it, is it still uh, sort of an enemy territory for you, or are you going to be joining that at some time? Uh, so this is a little bit inside baseball. Not all of you may know uh, what ODP is. Um, an announcement uh, some weeks, maybe a month ago now, 
by Hortonworks, one of our competitors in the market, and Pivotal, another of, of our competitors in the market, to collaborate on basically a standard bundle of bits uh, for people who wanted to run uh, big data platforms. Um, it is called the Open Data Platform. <laughs> I, I have no problem with it except that I don't believe it's open and it's not particularly a data platform. Um, outside of those two flaws, uh, <laughs> the, the, the core technology that's bundled is kind of the oldest part of the Hadoop ecosystem. So that original stuff, HDFS and, and MapReduce, um, where there's really no kind of compatibility problems, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, God, you know, I was running this great MapReduce on Hortonworks, and, and, then, and then I want to go run that MapReduce on Cloudera, and it didn't work. I mean, that's just not true, right? The, the APIs have been so stable for so long that migration among the platforms doesn't matter. Same is true for this storage layer, HDFS. Um, there's a lot of innovation in the open source ecosystem right now. There's all of these components that are flying around the edges and trying to get in, none of which are in the proposed open data platform. Um, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One is that it's tough to get broad industry consensus around a standard platform when every single vendor has their proprietary implementation of a piece of that technology that would transgress the standard. So, so I think, look, you know, it, it's, it's easy to get people to come together on a kernel of technology that's kind of ossified and not moving very fast. I don't think it's useful. Um, the other piece of technology in the open data platform is, candidly, the Hortonworks management console. And remember, I said Cloudera has its own management console. Well, I mean, in, in a way, the, the alliance was designed to make it impossible for me to come in, right? The only way I could do that would be to say, yeah, my competitor's product is better than mine. Surprisingly, we're not willing to say that. Um, <laughs> we don't think it's true, but we're not willing to say it. Um, I don't see that ODP solves a problem, um, and therefore, I don't think it's necessary for us to participate. We think we always have that the right place to drive standards is in the Apache Software Foundation, right? You show up, you bring the code, you implement the APIs, and then you can say how those APIs should behave. But that's the way you get to play, right? Um, that is our approach to the standards and where we're going to be. I have a question about the, uh, the transition of executives when you set aside what time in. Yeah. Uh, and you also mentioned LinkedIn and some other examples. Um, from someone who was sitting in the, the top chair and then stepping aside, what did you observe about Tom, the decision making and the type of people he brought in that just either took you by surprise or was just so different from how you approach it? What, what were the what were the real kind of qualitative differences in how you approach the CEO job? So a world class CEO has only a few jobs, right? You have to drive alignment on the team. You absolutely must do that. Everybody in the company has to know what you're doing and why. You gotta get the very best people into those jobs. You gotta be sure that you're coaching and mentoring them and that you're supporting them. If they're not, if they're not absolutely world-class at everything, that you're helping them to de develop and you're backing them up with others that can do it. You gotta be able to provide the resources. You gotta raise the money, right, that, that the company needs to operate. And then finally, You've got to impose the discipline and the plan so everybody knows how the companies behave and what it's going to do. Tom is without question better at me, better than me on every one of those. You know, you guys, I'm an engineer, right? You know, an extroverted engineer is the guy who stares at the other person's shoes when he talks to them. <laughs> <laughs> when there was conflict on the team, it was tempting, sometimes too tempting, and I took the temptation to avoid it. Right? Not to kind of drive alignment, not to force everybody into agreement on something, but to step back because it was just easier than raising those issues. If I had to highlight my failure as a manager, I hire too slowly. That is to say, we need a marketing guy, but you know, I still really want to understand what customers are talking about, so I'm gonna get out and I'm gonna to talk to all the customers. I'm gonna postpone that marketing hire for another six months while I just be sure that I really understand what the business is doing, right? So too slow to hire, right? I should have brought those people in earlier. We could have used the skills. And I'm also too slow to fire, right? I mean, you're not 100% on your hiring. When someone doesn't work out, you gotta have the stomach to walk them out back and shoot them in the head, right? Um, 
I was also too slow to do that, right? Hire someone into, and I picked this because it's not the example I mean, but hire someone to a finance job, and if they weren't doing a world-class job, well, what, am I gonna like mentor the guy in finance? Right, I'm an engineer, right? Um, so I think a really good hiring manager is fast to hire and fast to fire, and I was slow on both of those, and it cost the company. Um, laying out the strategy, Tom's done a very good job, he's come up with a bunch of our branding. I would say that that's the place where, where I feel like, like maybe I, 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 I was at least decent uh, as the company got big in the CEO role. Um, and then basically building the plan, imposing the operational discipline. Again, that's a lot of attention to budgeting and planning and forecasting and, and all of that's important. But, you know, I didn't wake up in the morning, yeah, man, staff meetings, yeah. <laughs> so so um, in every one of those respects, I think he came in and did the job that the company needed him to. It's been fun to watch him drive that alignment, right? That, that's really the, the core skill that, that I'm, I'm, I'm still super impressed by.